Welcome back, everyone. Muhammad's wars are many, with details scattered around through various Muslim sources. Professor Ayman Ibrahim's Muhammad's Military Expeditions is the most thorough and recent work in English on Muhammad's battles. The author explores dozens of primary Islamic sources, analyzes Muslim historiography, and surveys how Muslims and non-Muslims have received the accounts of Muhammad's wars. Because of numerous problems he finds with the Muslim sources, Ibrahim's evaluation of them can be summarized with three major points. First, he says Islamic historiography is better viewed as a representation of the time of documentation than of the period it allegedly describes. And I've added a parenthetical note that this includes what Ibrahim calls religious history. By this, he means that these accounts don't describe what really happened. Now, optimistically, they could describe what Muslim historians believed happened, or more pessimistically, they could describe what Muslim authors wanted people to believe about the past. That's a big difference. But as I've already indicated, what's important to remember about this for later is that it includes Muslim historians shaping putative past events into a sort of religious history. Second, Islamic historiography, including its accounts of Muhammad's Maghazi, or his military expeditions, conveys not only depictions of the past, but also, and perhaps more so, the political, religious, and social debate of the historians. And third, historical accounts, such as those of the Maghazi, are not only written, but also rewritten. These historical accounts are not only rewritten by different authors, but by different authors living under the authority of different Islamic regimes, such as the Umayyads and the Abbasids, who were, it's important to note, rivals. History, in such circumstances, may be subject to change. Muhammad's raid on the Jews of the Banu Qurayza tribe is an excellent case study to see how all of this is relevant. While there is some variation in the accounts, here's an overview of the events. Gabriel appears to Muhammad and tells him to fight the Banu Qurayza. The battle is therefore divinely commissioned, and Gabriel promises he himself will help. Next, Muhammad approaches the fort and kindly refers to the Jews as brothers of apes. Some sources report that the stubborn Jews even know Muhammad is a true prophet, prophesied in their own book, but they still reject him. Next comes a lengthy siege, during which Allah cast terror into the hearts of the Jews. They give up and Muhammad wins. At some point, Muhammad kills a Jewish woman in retaliation. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh is selected by the Jews or Muhammad, depending on which source you read, to declare judgment. Note that he formerly had a covenant with these same Jews that he was now pronouncing judgment against. And the sentencing is harsh. Six to nine hundred men beheaded by Muhammad or his men under Muhammad's supervision. Again, depending on which source you read, Sa'd's judgment received divine approval and Muhammad's praise. He was promised 70,000 angels to welcome him into paradise, which may seem anticlimactic if he was expecting 70,000 virgins. Now recall the three key Muslim historiographical literary devices Ibrahim detects in his book. First, Islamic historiography better represents the time of its documentation, which is much later. Remember, this includes fabricating history for religious reasons. Second, Islamic historiography more plausibly portrays the political, religious, and social debates of the historians. As Ibrahim puts it, Muslim texts were significantly influenced by their context. And the third point was that these accounts are not only written, but rewritten. Let's return to our outline of Muhammad's military expedition against the Banu Qurayza tribe, where you may first detect some fabricating or at least shaping of the account for religious reasons. Notice elements 2, 3, and 4. All of these are obvious, direct links to Quranic verses. For some, this kind of thing which happens throughout the Islamic texts in many different, sometimes conflicting ways, strains belief. Ibrahim comments, as we encounter repeatedly, Muslim historians serve as exegetes who design historical tales to unlock scriptural references. We've seen this in numerous videos on this channel in both the Quran and Hadith. We can trace a tale right from some esoteric rabbinic legend into the Islamic sources, at which point we are greeted with some story or stories, which may or may not even agree and may or may not even be remotely coherent, that are supposed to describe the alleged occasion of revelation for the verse. When this happens repeatedly, one starts to get suspicious. Professor Ibrahim puts it well when he says that Muslim historians serve as Quranic exegetes. This is especially relevant given the Quran's notoriously vague wording, which leaves many gaps to be filled in later. Or consider the second feature of Muslim historiography, where the context of the authors influences the text. Elements 1, 4, and 8 show divine approval 
of the raid against the Jews. Element 3 portrays the Jews as hopelessly stubborn. They know Muhammad is the prophet, but refuse him anyway. Number 5 shows that even a Jewish woman was not spared from Muhammad's sword. Number 2, calling them brothers of apes, is obviously dehumanizing. Every element of this account can be reduced to nothing more than Muslim historians attempting to spread hatred against the Jews. This obviously includes the harsh sentencing. Ibrahim comments, sought severe judgment against the Jews, massacring the men, taking the women and children captive, and dividing the possessions, should be viewed in the framework of descriptions aiming to drive anti-Jewish sentiments in medieval times. Contemporary context could also be what was influencing the Muslim historiographers as they wrote their conflicting accounts of who actually did the beheading. Was it Muhammad or his men? Additionally, this incredibly harsh judgment seems almost gleefully described in some Muslim sources. Ibrahim comments, The image of a vengeful, unforgiving, and aggressive Muhammad who slaughters people and takes women and children captive likely appealed to medieval Muslims who had no concern about depicting their prophet in such a way as they served the men in power the ruling elites in the Muslim Caliphate. Ibrahim clarifies that a distinction was made with the Jewish youths. Muslim soldiers examined the boys and killed the ones who appeared to have reached puberty. Many viewers will no doubt wish that Muslim men cared more about puberty and their relationships with females as well. Finally, consider elements 6 and 8 featuring Sa'ad ibn Wadh, who notably was a chief of a tribe that had a covenant with the Banu Qurayza. He was picture perfect. He was wounded in a previous battle, but still joined the raid. He had an alliance with the Jews, but his alliance with Muhammad was deeper. For this, he had extra rewards in paradise. And he was selected by the Jews to declare judgment on them, perhaps because of their former alliance, which presumably would garner some sympathetic judgment. Or did Muhammad make that selection? This would appear to be an example of rewriting, the third literary device. Ibrahim continues, while the Jews choosing Saad to judge them seems suitable for a particular context, it appears to credit the Jews with the high honor of assigning Saad an esteemed status. This memory did not fit in other times, so it needed to be tweaked, and its report was rewritten to credit Muhammad himself with designating Saad as honorable. The implications of Professor Ibrahim's thesis are many. For example, how much of the Quran's so-called exegesis is simply fabricated by Muslim authors? How much did the identity of Muhammad, his companions, and even his enemies change when the Muslim ruling class changed? How much had to be rewritten? And regarding the seemingly endless Muslim hatred for the Jews, arguably these accounts could have also aimed to terrorize the Jews who lived in the Islamic Caliphate during the time of documentation. It is plausible to deduce that these texts were shaped to humiliate the Jewish community in the conquered lands and to establish hegemony for Muslims as elites and religious notables. Of course, this raises other questions as well, like which is more important, what really happened in early Islamic history, or the reality Islamic historians have left us with, reality that exists in the minds of Muhammad's followers. Let me know what you think about all this in the comments section. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.